Well, thank you, Victoria, and good morning, everyone. Let me welcome you to this Sunday morning worship of the First Baptist Church of Sun Lakes. If you happen to be, hold on a second. I shouldn't look at my cell phone during the service, but the reason that I am is because I was expecting someone to maybe pass away this morning, but that was a false alarm. So let me start over. Let me welcome you Sunday morning worship of the First Baptist Church of Sun Lakes. We are delighted that you are here to worship with us here in the Worship Center, or if you're watching live via our YouTube channel, we are equally delighted that you are here as well. If you happen to be visiting with us this morning on this July 4th, we are equally delighted that you have come to worship with us. And if you are visiting, we invite you to visit our welcome table, which is in the foyer behind you. There will be someone there to greet you, maybe, maybe two people there to greet you. They'll present you with a gift in the form of a little blue bag, the contents of which we know for sure will be a blessing and an encouragement to you. Just a couple of uh, brief announcements. Next Saturday, July 10th at 10 a.m., the memorial service for Betty Smith will be here in the um, worship center, so we hope that you can attend that. If you didn't happen to get the uh, email yesterday, our dear sister in Christ, Connie Hunegard, went to be with the Lord yesterday morning, so we would ask that you would continue to pray for that family. Next week, well, we're going to have a guest speaker, but you know them. Chris and Sarah Lay, uh, missionaries, will be here next week. They will be speaking in the Bible Enrichment Hour at 8.30 and here in the worship uh, service as well. So we hope that, that you will be here. You don't want to miss the opportunity to hear them. Let me also make mention that after church this morning, after the worship service, we're going to eat. If you didn't have an opportunity to buy a ticket and you want to come and eat with us, they have informed me that there will be plenty of food and you are more than welcome to go down the hallway and have a hamburger, hot dog, potato salad, chips, and so forth. So if you want to do that, please feel free to do that. Let me also mention that last month, some of you came up to me and you said, hey, I think Joel's here. I think Joel is here because the Jamesons were here for Mother's Day. And I said, I don't think Joel's here. Well, today, Joel is here. So if you would like to say hello to him, that would, be, that would be great. So we're glad to see all of you here with us this morning. If you happen to have a phone with you this morning, please make sure that it's off at this time. We greatly, greatly appreciate your cooperation week by week. And now as we begin our worship service this morning, Brendan Ray is going to come and lead us. Brendan. As we all know, the 4th of July is a very important day for our country. So let us sing America the Beautiful, number 641.
certainly are thankful for our country. And we give thanks to God today for the freedoms we enjoy. We pray, of course, that those freedoms will continue, especially as we are seeing increasing threats to religious liberty in our nation. But we don't have to be afraid, aren't you glad? We don't have to be afraid. Please listen to these encouraging words from Elliot Clark. He says, hope for the Christian isn't just confidence in a certain glorious future. It's hope in a present providence. It's hope that God's plans can't be thwarted by local authorities or irate mobs, by unfriendly bosses or unbelieving husbands, by Supreme Court rulings or the next election. The Christian hope is that God's purposes are so unassailable that a great thunderstorm of events can't drive them off course. Even when we're wave-tossed and lost at sea, Jesus remains the captain of the ship and the commander of the storm. Thank God we have a risen Savior. Amen. A risen Savior, a risen Lord, King of kings, Lord of lords, on the throne, reigning forevermore. Would you pray with me this morning? Oh, Father, we do rejoice in you today, and we thank you for your mighty presence in the midst of your people. We also thank you for our country, our dear country, and for the privilege of celebrating our freedom on this day, July 4th. At the same time, O oh Lord, we continue to be dismayed by the sin and idolatry of our nation, the lawlessness, violence, hatred, and the growing trend toward a Marxist and atheistic worldview. Father, we know that we cannot simply ignore these things. They are upon us. Truly, we have dark places in our land, as the biblical writer puts it in Psalm 74, but, Father, we know that you have us here for a reason, a glorious reason, and that is to proclaim the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're so thankful that a Savior has come and that in him we have forgiveness. In him we have life. In him we have joy. In him we have a reason to live. Father, we pray that you will keep us usable as your witnesses so that our nation and other nations might know the truth and turn away from all the counterfeits that never bring lasting joy, lasting satisfaction, and healing. Oh, Lord, we ask that you use our church to point people to the truth. We cannot save, but we can proclaim the one who can and will save. Help us as a church body to understand our calling and the divine power you provide for us to fulfill that calling. And then I ask, Father, that our worship today will be pleasing in your sight. True worship that flows from adoring hearts to the God who is worthy, infinitely worthy of all our praises. May this worship be reflected in the way we sing the way we pray, the way we give undivided attention to the living word as it is being proclaimed. What a joy to be where we are, worshiping you in spirit and in truth. I ask, Father, that you open our hearts today. Holy Spirit, we welcome you and your ministry of teaching us the word of God. Oh, Lord, may none of us leave this place unchanged. Help us, we ask. Help us to exalt Jesus with all our hearts, celebrating the eternal victory of his atoning death and bodily resurrection. And it is in his name, the name of Jesus, our only Savior, that I pray, amen. Isn't it a blessing to know that regardless of what woes may wash over our country, we have an eternal Father above that we can cling to, unchanging, the solid rock. We're going to sing the solid rock next, number 511 in your hymnals. My hope is 
One of my personal favorites, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, number 98 in your hymnals. a blessing. Amen. God has given to us that we might be generous in giving to others Amen. and in giving so that the good news of the gospel of the kingdom might spread throughout our community, throughout our state, our nation, and to the end of the earth. God bless you for your faithful giving of tithes and offerings. I'll ask Gary Nessel to come and lead us as we now dedicate these tithes and offerings to the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. It seems like every first Sunday I stand up on my soapbox and say something, and I want to uh, go off of uh, Pastor's prayer earlier. This uh, world is. Uh, Definitely, uh, United States of America is definitely in a hurting place. Uh, I read yesterday that uh, 
we that fly our flag are considered radicals. Uh, yeah, I have an issue with that being a military man, so. Um, we, um, we celebrate this day because a long time ago, some patriots decided that we didn't need to be hampered, we need to be a Christian nation, and that's what we are today. And uh, God bless, I hope we don't have to have another 9-11 to bring people back to what the world is really about. And I pray that doesn't happen. Let us pray, please. Our gracious and most heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. Lord, we ask for your comforting hand upon those who are ill and those who are families that are grieving this day. Lord, it is with great gratitude that we know that you are here and with those people and, and with us all. Lord, we look forward to the blessings that you bring us and we are so glad that, that you are with us at all times. We pray that. Lord, we ask for your blessings on this tithes and offerings today that they may be used here and around the world to spread your word and the joy of your word. Lord, we cannot Express our gratitude so much for you dying for us and for our sins. Lord, we ask that you be with the pastor as he brings us our message today. May we open our ears and our hearts. And we ask this in your precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you. Next, we will be singing Pentecost Hymn, a beautiful hymn, number 370 in your hymn books. Let me ask you to turn in your Bibles, if you will, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 1. And while you're turning, let me say how good it is to be back in Sun Lakes. My wife and I had a very enjoyable time in Texas. I guess we went from about 110 degrees and 5% humidity to 95 degrees and 87% humidity. <laughs> We really beat the heat, didn't we? But it was worth it. We had, a, we had a great time. Great time. I appreciate Pastor Kyle filling in for me so ably as he always does. Acts chapter 1. If you'd like to stand with me, we're going to read a few verses of Scripture this morning before we come to our time of observing the Lord's Supper. We pick up in verse 6. Acts chapter 1. And beginning in verse 6, the Bible says, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now let me say that we should remember that the disciples, the apostles, are speaking at this point to the risen Christ. This is after his crucifixion and his resurrection from the dead. And so they have a question for him. And we see that question there in verse 6. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, 
Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Would you pray with me? Father, what an amazing few verses of Scripture we have before us this morning. Be our teacher, I pray, over these next minutes. May we hear from you. May we never be the same again because we've heard from you. Be honored, O Lord. Be glorified. Be exalted. Through the study of your word, we rejoice in our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray together. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Verse 3, a verse we've already covered in previous days. But verse 3 in Acts 1 says that after the resurrection, Jesus presented himself alive. To his apostles. Now think with me about that for a moment. (laughs) What an amazing statement here. He who had been brutally executed and then buried in a tomb that was guarded by Roman soldiers is now presenting himself alive to his apostles. You know, that was a sad day for the devil, don't you think? He had to know it was coming. But I'm sure he hoped against hope that it would not come. But it did come. And it was important for the resurrected Christ to be seen by others. It provided an undeniable confirmation of his divine person and work. An undeniable confirmation. Now the Bible tells us that 40 days after his resurrection... The Lord Jesus ascended up into the clouds to return home to heaven. But before ascending, he gave instruction to those he was leaving behind. And this instruction is for us as well. We learn from the words of Jesus that we are given divine priorities. And we are given divine power, and then thirdly, we are given a divine promise. Let's consider the first of these. We have divine priorities as believers. Now, notice the question again. The disciples asked Jesus in verse 6, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? You see, they understood that the Messiah is the one who will establish God's kingdom on earth. But they wanted to know when the kingdom would be restored to Israel. As Jews, they had always been taught to expect the Messiah to set up a literal millennial kingdom on earth. The word millennial indicating a thousand year reign. And so the disciples were right as to the truth of the coming kingdom, but they were wrong as to the time of it. The establishment of the millennial kingdom awaits the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 7, Jesus didn't rebuke his disciples for asking the question. He simply explained that God the Father has not revealed his timetable for the coming kingdom. You see, the disciples were interested in God's plan for the end of the world. But Jesus was interested in their receiving power to reach the world before it ended. Therefore, he was redirecting their attention to the task of global evangelism. So the important thing is not to be curious about the future, but to be faithful in the present. Sharing the message of God's eternal and spiritual kingdom. That was the priority of Jesus for his disciples. That was it. And it must be a priority for us. So in answer to their question about restoring the kingdom to Israel, Jesus said to the disciples, In verse 7, it is not for you to know times or seasons 
that the Father has fixed by his own authority. You see, there were some things with which the disciples were not to be concerned, but there were other things with which they were to be very concerned. And that brings me to the next truth in this passage. We're not only given divine priorities, but notice with me, secondly, and I love this, don't you? Secondly, we are given by God divine power. Now, verse 8 is a well-known and often quoted verse. It's a wonderful verse. Jesus says to those men on the hillside that day, right before he ascended back to his Father in heaven, he said to them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, the power Jesus mentions here is not a reference to physical power, of course. It's not a reference to political power or the power of personality. No, this is a different kind of power altogether. This is God's power we're talking about. The power of the Holy Spirit, resurrection power. I mean, think of it. The very power of the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that has raised believers from spiritual death. And the same power that uses us as witnesses for Jesus. Therefore, this kind of power, this kind of power, the power of the Holy Spirit cannot be overcome. It cannot be stopped. Every obstacle thrown in its way is actually used as an opportunity for greater advancement. This power needs no props. It needs no outside help. It doesn't borrow anything from the world in order to get the job done. And yet, sadly, there are churches today that are borrowing from the world in a relentless but futile effort to stay relevant. It seems these churches have capitulated to the culture in order to avoid being called bigoted intolerant or some other pejorative term these so-called churches seem embarrassed by the gospel and they have no confidence in the authority of the Bible for example a certain church tweeted about its celebration of all sexual orientations and gender identities and interestingly a self-described atheist gave this reply he said, if your church is just preaching the exact same thing as the broader culture, what's the point of going to church? Just imbibe the party line somewhere with more comfortable seats. Exactly. But by God's grace, we don't preach the party line of secular culture. We preach the truth. We preach the gospel of the kingdom. We preach Christ and Him crucified. And we preach salvation only through Him. Now, in the latter part of verse 8, we see God's strategy. And this is a wonderful strategy in verse 8. We see God's strategy for reaching the world for Christ. Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Notice the next part. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So the disciples were to begin their work where? In Jerusalem. In their own community. And this would include, of course, their neighbors, family, friends, the people around them. Then they were also to reach out to Judea, their own country. In other words, the region in which the city of Jerusalem was located. You see, home missions is just as important as international missions. If we're not concerned about our own country, how can we really be concerned about other countries? But of course, it's not either or. We understand that, don't we? It's both and. Then the disciples were to go to Samaria. Now, this is where it gets interesting. <laughs> They were to go into Samaria, the region to the north of Judea, and it actually took revival breaking out in Samaria before the disciples showed any willingness to go there. 
And that's because historically, ethnic and cultural tensions had raged between the Jews and the Samaritans, and the two groups tried to avoid each other as much as possible. But folks, God had plans not just for Jerusalem and Judea, but for Samaria as well. By the way, you'll remember Jesus went through Samaria. He didn't go around it like people would have expected him to do in that day. He went through Samaria. Why? He had a divine appointment. She didn't know this was coming, but he had a divine appointment with the woman at the well, proclaimed to her the gospel of the kingdom. Her life was changed, and she went out to tell the whole town about this Messiah she had just met. God had plans not only for the Jews, but he had plans for the Gentiles. I'm glad he did, for one. Amen. I'm glad he did. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. And then lastly, the disciples were to evangelize to the end of the earth. Do you think that pretty well covers it? I mean, that's all of it, isn't it? To the end of the earth. Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now, prior to the book of Acts, the emphasis was on Israel. From Acts on, the entire world is in view. Acts is a pivotal book. It's a powerful book. You know, it's believed that within a few years, the largest and strongest branch of the Christian faith will be in Africa. Therefore, it is crucial, absolutely crucial, that the church in the United States pour as many resources as possible into the evangelical churches of the third world, especially Africa. We have the materials, we have the means for the people there to be grounded spiritually and strengthened for future generations. They cannot provide these resources, but we can. We are to take the gospel to the end of the earth. If we can't go, we can invest in those who are going. And next Sunday, we will get to hear from a couple who are faithfully serving God in one of those faraway places that is in desperate need of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But as followers of Christ, you and I are called to be witnesses wherever we are. Isn't that true? And the deeper our love for the gospel, the greater will be our desire to get it out there. I mean, that's really the key when you think about it, isn't it? The deeper our love for the gospel. That is to say, reminding ourselves continually of the change that God has brought to us through the atoning death of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Reminding ourselves day by day of the power of the gospel. As the Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The deeper our love for the gospel, the greater will be our desire to proclaim it. Some years ago, Dr. Chuck Kelly, the president of New Orleans Seminary, told this story. He said, my wife and I went to one of those fancy New Orleans restaurants for an anniversary celebration. I walked in, went to the head waiter, and requested a table for two reserved in the name of Kelly. He looked at me and asked how someone with the name Kelly got a large Jewish nose like mine. I looked back at him and said, I guess it is because I have a Jewish Savior named Jesus, and He loved me so much that He gave me His nose. <laughs> the waiter laughed and said, that's pretty good. And I replied, so is Jesus. I had a tract with me, and I pulled it out and gave it to him. He took us to our table and walked off looking at the tract. I did not quote a single verse of the Bible, nor did I get into a deep theological discussion. I never had a training course on how to use your nose for evangelism. 
All I did was open my mouth and say a good word about Jesus. That's what witnessing is. Any Christian can say a good word about Jesus. He's right, isn't he? And it's the power of the Holy Spirit that makes proclaiming the gospel effective. You see, the Spirit's power is not a luxury. It's an absolute necessity. So we are given divine priorities and divine power. One other thing, and I love this too, we are given a divine promise. Let's look at verse 9 for a moment in Acts 1. And when he had said these things as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. (laughs) Can you imagine a more unforgettable moment than that? Jesus literally ascends from the ground up, up, up into the sky. He had risen from the dead in secret. But now he ascends openly, visibly defying the law of gravity. But that shouldn't surprise us. Jesus invented the law of gravity. So verse 9 says, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. That is to say, he ascended up into the clouds. Now, I want you to notice something with me for a moment. The word ascend, as it relates to Jesus going back to heaven, means far more than simply going up. The word refers to going up to a specific place to perform a specific task. You see, Jesus was ascending to where he would be enthroned as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He was going home, right? Going home, up through the clouds, up beyond the stars, back to the place from where he came. But now, now he was different. Now he had a human body, one that was battle-scarred, resurrected, and glorified. Jesus had lived in heaven before, of course, but not as a man. Now, however, he ascends to his heavenly home in a perfect human body. What must it have been like? Have you ever thought about this? What must it have been like when Jesus re-entered heaven after having finished his mission on earth? Did the place explode with praise? How could it not? No doubt he was watched by the adoring angels as he went right up to the throne of God and sat down at his father's right hand. Think about it, folks. A man in a human body is seated on God's throne. For you see, Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. He has every right to be there. A man in a previous century was persecuted for his faith and his preaching and was eventually executed. But before his death, he said this, He who believes that Christ rules above need not fear what happens below. That's a good word for us in our country today, isn't it? He who believes that Christ rules above need not fear what happens below. Well, praise God, Jesus is ruling and reigning above. No wonder we sing, lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven, exalted high. Hallelujah. What a Savior. By the way, I love the order in the book of Acts. Jesus went up, the Spirit came down, the witnesses went out, and the lost came in. That's God's order. In His perfection and sovereignty, there is an order and beauty in the way He does things. In fact, you see that all through the Bible, don't you? God knows what He's doing. He knows what He's doing. Now, remember, the word ascend not only means going up to a specific place, going up to a specific place to perform a specific task. So the ascension of Jesus means that we now have an advocate with the Father. We have a mediator in heaven, a great high priest who is Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means that he's doing something. What's he doing? He's interceding for us. 
He's praying for us. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 says, He is able, don't you love this? He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. Think about it. Jesus is in heaven praying for us. Let that sink in. We know that on the cross he cried out, it is finished. And it was. For in that moment Jesus paid our sin debt in full. It was a finished work. But Jesus now has what we could call an unfinished work. It is that of interceding for us. And he will continue to carry it on until he takes us home. Now... Verse 10 mentions two men in white robes who appeared with the disciples as they watched Jesus. I mean, there's a lot going on on the hillside this day, right? All this wonderful teaching, this instruction, and then Jesus in a resurrected, glorified body is ascending back to the Father in heaven. And now we have some angels that show up. There's a lot going on here. And there's no doubt that these were angels. And when you think about it, it makes sense because... Angels had announced the birth of Jesus. They had been there and watched his temptation in later years. They had strengthened him during his agony there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Angels had proclaimed his resurrection. And now angels are there at the ascension of Jesus. Furthermore, look at the promise they give in verse 11. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Well, the angels left, but the message remained. That is to say the message of the gospel, the good news. As we saw in verse 8, the disciples were to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. And that's our commission as well. Jesus says in Matthew 28, verse 20, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. If you ever have any doubt that Jesus knows what is happening in your life, if you ever have any doubt that he's still with you, go back and review what he says. And what he says is always right. It's always true. He never lies. He never makes a mistake. He never misspeaks. He says, behold, I am with you, what? Always, even to the end of the age. So think about it. Jesus is with us, and as we see in Acts 1, he will come back for us. Could there be any greater promises than these? He's with us. He's coming back for us. Now, times are not easy. But when have they ever really been easy? For example, God told Isaiah to preach the message, but that the people would not listen. Noah preached 120 years, but had no converts. 120 years of preaching. No converts other than his family. He went into the ark a minority, but he came out a majority. That's right. God was with him, and he is with us. We have the unfailing promises of God. Oh, review those promises. Review those promises. Review the attributes of God. Know who he is and what he is doing, and praise his holy name, and your perspective will change from one of dismay and despair and discouragement to one of joy and peace and victory because we belong to the one who won the victory on our behalf. Over 350 years ago, and I'm coming to a close, believe it or not, over 350 years ago, a shipload of travelers landed on the northeast coast of America. The first year, they established a town site. The next year, they elected a town government. The third year, the town government planned to build a road five miles westward into the wilderness In the fourth year, the people tried to impeach their town government 
because they thought it was a waste of public funds to build a road five miles westward into the wilderness. Who needed to go there anyway? Now think about that for a moment. Here were people who had the vision to see 3,000 miles across an ocean and overcome incredible hardships to get there. But in just a few years, they were not able to even see five miles out of town. They had lost their pioneering vision. As believers, we must never lose our vision of who we are in Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that God has provided for us to declare the life-changing message of the gospel And in this day of great confusion and desperation, what a privilege it is to speak a good word about Jesus. To tell others who he is and what he did in accomplishing the work of salvation. The great writer C.S. Lewis said, human history, listen to this, human history is the long terrible story of man which will make him happy. He is so right. And what a concise summary that is of human history. The long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. But as you know, we have something that makes us happy. We have God himself as our heavenly father, and we have his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as our savior. A Savior who paid our sin debt in full on the cross, who defeated death through His resurrection, who then went back home to heaven where He prays for us, and who has promised to come back for us so that we might spend an eternity with Him. How could it get any better than that? And we say, hallelujah, what a Savior. What a Savior. What a Redeemer. What a friend. He's coming back. I want to tell you, the message of the gospel is worth sharing, isn't it? (laughs) The message of the gospel is worth sharing. We've been given divine priorities, divine power, and a divine promise. Let's pray together. Father, as we come now to the observance of the Lord's Supper, I ask that you help us rejoice afresh for the unshakable assurance that our salvation gives us of your continuing work in our lives. I gladly acknowledge that you who began a good work in us, as your word says, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I also thank you for the assurance of a full and final salvation to come, an eternal and glorious future that we have in Christ. Oh, Lord, we know that this hope is guaranteed by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus from the dead. Therefore, we rejoice that he who finished his work for us will also finish his work in us. To God be the glory. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. The man who wrote the hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, said these last words right before he died. Glory to God in the height of his divinity. Glory to God in the depth of his humanity. Glory to God in his all-sufficiency. Into his hands I commend my spirit. Think about that. In the height of divinity, Jesus came to earth in the depth of humanity. And because of his accomplishment on the cross, we can say glory to God in his all sufficiency. This is why we celebrate the Lord's Supper. It is. This is why we do it on a regular basis. For through the powerful symbolism of this meal, we are reminded over and over again, and that's the way it should be, we are reminded of the all-sufficient sacrifice Jesus made on our behalf.
as another hymn writer put it, full atonement can it be. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Yes, Jesus did make full atonement. He gave himself for us, providing for us the full and final remedy for our sins. And so this morning we call to mind afresh the broken body and the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. A sacrifice made for us so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have life in his name. Now, as you may know, it is not a requirement for a person to be a member of this church in order to participate with us in the Lord's Supper. But it is important that those who participate know that they are members of the family of God. For according to what we see in Scripture, those who participate in the Lord's Supper are those who have repented of their sins and have placed their faith in Christ alone as Lord and Savior. So if that's your testimony this morning, we welcome you to participate with us in this wonderfully symbolic meal. And then for those of us who know Christ, we must make sure that we have prepared hearts. That is to say, we carefully look within to see if there is anything at all that we need to make right with God. The bread and the juice will be passed in a few moments, and that will, of course, be a good time to spend a few moments asking God to show us anything that he would want to show us before we partake of the bread and the juice. And the Holy Spirit is faithful to honor our prayers, to search our hearts, and to show us what we need to see. And so at this time, I'll ask our men to come as we prepare to observe the Lord's Supper. As you may know, shortly before his crucifixion, Jesus had a meal there in the upper room with his disciples. The Bible says he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This is the word of the Lord. We give thanks for it. Let us now observe prayerfully and worshipfully and joyfully the Lord's Supper.
Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be here to give honor and glory and praise to you for our salvation, for your sacrifice, for giving of yourself that we might be born again and one day see you face to face. Thank you, Lord. We praise you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. May we eat the bread together in remembrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died and shed his blood for us, may this symbol of your blood shed for us give us strength to spread your word here and around the world. Lord, we are so much in need of you. 
Lord, we know that you're always with us, and we, for that we give you blessings. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so once again, with great thanksgiving in our hearts for the price Jesus paid in order to accomplish salvation for us, may we drink the cup together. The Bible says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And as we've already talked about this morning, he is coming back. He is coming back. Revelation 1 verse 7 says, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. So we rejoice this morning in what Jesus accomplished for us. And we also rejoice in the fact that he's coming back for us. And we will spend an eternity. Those who know Christ as Lord and Savior will spend an eternity with him. And in a moment, we'll express our joy by singing, Hallelujah, what a Savior. As our men take a moment and collect the cups right now, let me mention our ministry offering that we customarily receive on Lord's Supper Sundays. There will be men at the exits if you would like to give toward this. It's entirely up to you, of course, but uh, we're always interested in helping people in every way that we can, and so as we discover needs, whether in our own church body or in the community, we want to be able to assist and do what we do in Jesus' name. Whatever we do should be done for the glory of God and in the name of our Savior. What a privilege it is to be able to give. If you're our guest today, just know how very, very happy we are to have you here. And if you go by the welcome table back in our main foyer, as Pastor Kyle mentioned earlier, uh, you'll be greeted there and uh, given a blue bag. I don't see anybody there right now, but surely there will be somebody there in just a moment. But we want you to have that little gift. We think, uh, we think you'll enjoy the contents very much, and we're so glad that you're here. God bless you. Let's stand together. Let's sing. Let's worship. Let's rejoice. Hallelujah. What a Savior. say a quick word before we go. God bless you richly and continue to pour out his grace and blessings upon you. 
Uh, you heard the announcement Pastor Kyle made earlier about the meal, so uh, we hope that uh, you'll be able to stay and enjoy that time of eating and fellowship with us. As you go down the hall right over here toward the fellowship area, uh, it probably would be good to uh, walk down the left side as the, as the line is going down the hall, and that will keep the doors open for the for the kitchen area, and I'm sure there will be further instruction once we get back in that area. Pray with me. Father, thank you so very much for all you have done in our hearts and in our minds this morning. To you be the glory. And we say together, hallelujah, what a Savior. Thank you for the food, Father. This is one of your gracious gifts. Bless it to the strength of our bodies in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.